Over on Jaguar Gator 8, a new college football video is out. In this video, we talk about the 1994 Iron Bowl between Alabama and Auburn, and why ABC decided not to nationally televise that game for some bizarre reason. Click the card in the upper right corner to watch. And now, on with our feature presentation. Bart Starr, the quarterback, is one of the greatest and most influential players of all time. I don't think anyone's got a bad thing to say about Bart Starr when he was on the field in his playing days, because he truly was amazing, exceeding all expectations that just about anyone had of him coming into the league as a 17th round pick, all the way back in 1956. I would be here all day if I listed every single accolade in his career. He made it to four Pro Bowls, led the NFL in passer rating four times, led the NFL in completion percentage four times, was named the MVP of the league in 1966, won five NFL championships as Green Bay's starting quarterback, won two Super Bowls, and was named the MVP of the Super Bowl twice, was named onto the All-1960s team as one of the best quarterbacks of the decade, got his jersey number retired, and got inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame on the first ballot, all while being the anchor and the figure of arguably the greatest dynasty in the history of professional football. Bart Starr as a player is a legend, and is held in incredibly high regard today, and rightfully so. But Bart Starr the head coach? Yeah, not so much. It's actually a testament to how great of a player he was that Green Bay fans still adore him to this day, and that he got to hold on to his job for close to a decade solely because of his name, because him as the leading man in charge of a team was nothing short of a disaster. In nine seasons with the Packers, there was not a single season where he won more than eight games. It was a wasted decade. He made the playoffs just once in nine years, and that came in the strike short in 1982 season, where even though the Packers were 5-3-1 and, and were a solid team, let's be honest, any team with a pulse made the playoffs that year. He went 52-76-3, winning just 40% of his games, which was a far cry from the 61% of his games he won as the starting quarterback. The fact that he survived nine seasons as a head coach with a resume that bad is kind of amazing, because he had to have what felt like the longest leash of any coach in NFL history who accomplished absolutely nothing. And there were many, and I truly mean, many bad moments during his tenure on the sidelines. Heck, I talked about one of them in a previous video of mine, when he made an idiotic call on 4th and 9 in a Monday night football game against the New York Giants, where he decided to run the ball, in a call so bad that the announcers were literally laughing in the booth at how bad it was. You can learn more about that train wreck by clicking the card on the upper right corner. But this one transcends them all, and it might be one that, even though it's been somewhat forgotten throughout NFL history, is worth mentioning. Because holy cow, I don't know why any coach thought this would be a good idea, especially Bart Starr of all people. In 1980, Starr needed to get his message across to his team about behavior that would not be tolerated under any circumstances, because he was fed up with it. And to get the message across, Starr decided to do it in the worst way possible, to the point where afterwards, one player in particular was so offended and insulted by it that he called Starr a racist. It was a decision so bad that it just about sums up his time in Green Bay as a head coach, which was full of bad decision after bad decision. And this is the story behind what has to be, in the otherwise legendary career of Bart Starr, the worst moment of his entire career. Before I talk about the incident in question, we need some context to understand why Starr was fed up, because it's not like this came out of nowhere and was a spontaneous moment. The year is 1980, and as we enter a new decade, Starr and the Packers are thrilled to be leaving the 1970s behind. The 60s were a great time for the Packers, as they established themselves as one of the greatest dynasties ever assembled, winning title after title. The 70s? Yeah, not so much, as they failed to win a single playoff game and only made the playoffs once, when they made it in 1972 and were one and done. And the final five years of the 70s were coached by the man you've been watching this whole time, Bart Starr. They were not good. In those five seasons, the Packers went 26-47-1, winning a mere 35% of the time. It was a half-decade full of misery, and the 1979 season, which was the most recent one, was no different, as Green Bay went 5-11, thanks to an awful stretch at one point during the year 
where they lost seven out of eight. And thanks to an abysmal offense that averaged just 15.4 points per game, ranking 25th in the NFL out of 28 teams. In other words, tensions were already high and everyone could feel the pressure. The last thing that Starr and the team needed heading into 1980 was any distractions whatsoever. He wanted everyone to be on the same page and didn't want any funny business happening, like any leaks happening to reporters. I should note to provide further context as to what's about to happen, that Starr did not exactly have a great relationship with the press. In fact, he sort of hated the press. In 1978, he threatened four reporters who reported on the Packers reportedly trying to sign running back Dwayne Thomas, even though the story was 100% true by Starr's own admission. As he said, you can print what you want, but if you print this, you're not going to come through this store again. As shown from that incident, Starr wanted to run an extremely tight ship and didn't want anything getting out to the press before he could control the narrative. And two years later, in 1980, once again, everything was about to go haywire. Because toward the middle of August, as the Packers were making roster cuts like literally every team does in the preseason around this time, it got reported as to who the cuts were, with nine players getting cut to reduce the roster size to 59. Among the players cut included running back Barty Smith, running back Nate Simpson, linebacker Gary Weaver, and safety Steve Wagner. Now, the report was completely 100% accurate, However, at no point prior to that article being published did Starr reveal the cuts, or did the Packers put out any statement saying who was getting cut. This meant that someone in the organization leaked the news to the press. And to say that Starr was furious about this would be an understatement, because Starr was about as frustrated as you could possibly be. Starr said, in a lengthy tirade, there had always been rumors, but this is the first time I was so embarrassed by it. He then added, It seems there is a trend in society to leak information, particularly to you people. It does put us in a very embarrassing situation. There were a few other quotes in there that I won't repeat, just because they're all extremely similar. But basically, if you were playing a drinking game and took a shot every time Star said the word embarrassed or embarrassing during this tirade of his, you would be dead. Naturally, Star thought that a player was the one who leaked the news because who else could it possibly be? Ironically, it wasn't a player, but rather was the teenage son of one of the employees on the team who had no idea that the information was supposed to be confidential and had no idea that it was even true. As the teenager said, I had no idea that what I said about roster cuts was going to be printed. Heck, I don't know any more about what's going on here than anyone else. I just thought we were speculating about who'd make the team and who wouldn't. Still, Starr didn't know this at the time. He believed it was a player. And Starr wanted to make sure that something like this would never happen again. The press, in his mind, had no right to know. So Starr met with his team and gave them a stern talking to. However, when he gave this talk, he brought in something from his office to help get that point across. I want you to imagine literally the worst possible thing you can bring in for a situation like this to demonstrate your authority and how serious this issue is, and that there will be repercussions to anyone who disobeys you. Because, yep, Bart Starr went there. Hanging in Bart Starr's office were two noteworthy things in particular. The first was a picture of a cowboy, which was given to him by his wife. Inscribed was the quote, There was a hell of a lot of things they didn't tell me when I hired on with this outfit. While there is no exact picture of Starr's office and what it looked like, there is a very good chance that the picture and the inscription look something like this, and there is a very good chance it was the Frame Cowboy by Bill Hampton, which you can buy today. And the second thing was something to go along with the picture of the cowboy. That was something given to him by a former teammate of his as a gift. And that, as you might have been able to guess, was a whip. So when Starr decided to get his message across to the team, that he wasn't going to tolerate any more nonsense, and he took the whip off of his office wall and to the meeting to illustrate this point, you can imagine how that was construed. Literally the worst possible prop you could bring. For those who don't know or aren't tying two and two together, a brief history lesson. Whips were prominently used by slave owners in the 1800s 
to abuse and punish slaves and to force them to work. There are many, and I mean many graphic photographs and depictions of slaves getting whipped that I won't share here, but you can look at it in your own time if you wish, to the point where it was unfortunately not uncommon at all to have slaves whose backs were completely scarred with whips. And in the case of some slave owners, if you tried to fight back against the whipping and tried to disobey authority, you got killed. So when you have a white man coming into a locker room, furious about his team's disobedience, with the team comprising mainly of black men, and he brings a whip to illustrate this point that this will not be tolerated, yeah, you can see how this would be a major problem. While players were frustrated and shocked about this, the most outspoken one, by far, was running back Ricky Patton. As Patton said on the incident, he chose the wrong prop. Can you imagine what the black guys thought when they saw a bullwhip? The first thing that goes through your mind is slavery days. Now, while Starr never denied the fact that he brought the whip into the locker room, he has a completely different version of the story, saying that he was stunned that anyone could possibly be offended by this. As Starr said, That's insane. I did it one day in a light moment. I think it was after a win. However, Starr's story is literally impossible, because both parties say that it happened during the 1980 offseason, and Patton wasn't on the Packers after that offseason. It could not have possibly been after a win or in a light moment, since the Packers won a grand total of zero preseason games that year. And seeing as Patton said that the incident took place after the leaks, and knowing what we know about Starr with how frustrated and angry he was after leaks, and knowing Starr's history with trying to fight reporters after the leaks, everything adds up. Now I have to make a full disclosure here. I genuinely do not believe that Starr meant anything by this. I want to clear that up right now. In no way whatsoever do I think Starr had any racial intent behind this, or even for one iota of a second, considered the potential problems with bringing a whip to a meeting to talk to his players to express his authority. All the evidence points in that direction. Number one, Starr lived 85 wonderful years on this earth, and this is literally the only incident in his life that I could find regarding anyone accusing him of being a racist. That just wasn't in his blood. Number two, Starr, who grew up in the Deep South in Alabama, visited Detroit every summer growing up and played football with black people on the lots, speaking about his experience and how much he learned over those summers and how valuable it was to him. He said, I remember it so well because it was the first time I ever met blacks in a competitive situation. I'd play with them in pickup games on vacant lots. I lived in Alabama and it just wasn't done then down there. Number three, Starr played under head coach Vince Lombardi, and Lombardi was famously outspoken against racism. He was ahead of his time, to the point where he threatened to cut anyone engaging in racist behavior. He had a zero-tolerance policy. In Lombardi's eyes, the most important color was the color of your jersey, and not the color of your skin. If you could help this team win games, then you were welcome here. Starr had no incidents with that, which, if he had would have been fairly well publicized knowing what we know about Lombardi. And number four, there was an entire award named after Bart Starr that is given annually by the NFL to the player who, in the NFL's words, best exemplifies outstanding character and leadership in the home, on the field, and in the community. They would not name the award after someone who was a racist, and especially in today's day and age in 2022, they would not keep the award named after someone deemed to be a racist they would have changed that name immediately. So I have to make that extremely clear. I genuinely do not believe Starr meant anything by this. I genuinely think that Starr grabbed the whip, thought it would be a good idea, didn't even stop for one second to consider the racial implications of it, and if he did think about it, he would have reevaluated, would not have brought the whip, and would have tried a different approach. If this one meeting is the only piece of dirt you've got regarding racism in 85 years, and all of your actions in the community contradict that one, then I think that speaks for itself. Having said that, you get how this could be perceived, right? If you were a player in that locker room, as Patton and the guys were, and you saw your head coach, furious and all, pull out a whip, I mean, it's not even subtle. And it blows my mind, truly blows my mind, how Star never even thought about this for a second. If you're bringing a prop into the locker room, to try and send a message to your team, just quit while you're ahead. 
because it's not going to work and it never has worked. It failed spectacularly in 2003 when Jacksonville Jaguars head coach Jack Del Rio brought an axe and a tree stump into the locker room, leading his punter, Chris Hansen, to miss the rest of the season with a foot injury after a swing gone wrong. It didn't work in 1989 when Atlanta Falcons interim head coach Jim Hannafin decided to motivate his team by bringing in four sticks of dynamite and having his players touch the dynamite. Yes, this is a real story. And it clearly didn't work in 1980 with whatever Bart Starr was going for here with the whip. It insulted his players, and it was just a very, very questionable move. Because of all the great and brilliant moments of Starr's career, this was not one of them. This has to be, considering the circumstances, the worst moment of Starr's otherwise incredible career. Get your official Jaguar Gator 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com. And be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, and subscribe down below if you haven't already, as it helps the channel out a lot. And be sure to check out Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern for your chance to play NFL trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this condensed down to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at Jaguar9. To see college football videos, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 8. To see highlight videos of players throughout the history of the NFL, subscribe to JG9 Highlights. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. So you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.